Good morning. Great to be in the Lord's house this morning. Uh, just want to bring your attention to a few announcements. Uh, don't forget, this evening is Trunk of Treat. Uh, we are still needing some cars and we still need some volunteers to help us, especially for the bounce house and the and the hayride. And so if you could help us with those, please put your name back there and come join us this evening. We still need some. You have candy, you have brought it yet, please. Yes. Hey, right, it's covered. Hey, right, it's covered. All right. Luke is his bounce house, but he does need an assistant. Right, need an assistant. I think Peggy's going to come and help okay. with the bounce house. Okay, good deal. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank y'all. And so if you have a car and you want to come and pass out candy, it's really simple. We have the candy for you. So if you can help us with that, we'd appreciate it. Come and join us this afternoon. Um, also, uh, this Wednesday morning, prayer time here at the church building, 9 o'clock. Uh, come and join us for that. And next week. Clocks fall back. Aren't you excited? You get all this extra sleep? Not worth it. Oh, I already don't like it. It's already dark. It's so early now. And so um, make sure you fix your clocks next week. You come to church, okay? Any other announcements? All right. Appreciation Month, and we do want to let you know, Mike, that we do appreciate you. Do you know all the different things that he does? He does a sermon, he does the Sunday school, he does a Wednesday night class, he helps clean, you help mow. Um, let's see, I know there's some more. Say it loud. He goes to the hospital when people are sick. <laughs> That's right. Uh, anybody else got one that he does? Worship service. <coughs> what was back there? Lead the singing. He leads the singing. Do y'all see all the things that Brother Mike does? And of course, he drags along Glenda to do this and that to also. And we want to appreciate you too as well. So, uh, Brother Mike. Come up, and we're going to have a special prayer for him, and I'd like for you to be praying for him at the same time. Father God in heaven, we just thank you for your mercy and your kindness and your love. And we thank you that you sent Brother Mike here to us to help us to learn about you, to strive to do the things that we should be doing for you. Uh, we ask, Lord, that your special blessing be upon him and help him to see your plan for this church, for us, helping to be bold in his words, helping to speak truth. And Father, we just ask that you uh, give him good health and good spirit. In Jesus' name, we thank you for him. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs> and he helps me with my computer, too. <laughs> thank you all very much. I appreciate all the, the outpouring of appreciation this month, and I, I and we could not really enjoy being here and being a part of this congregation, so thank you very, very much. Uh, how about any anniversaries this week? How about birthdays? I know that somebody has a birthday. Who, who is that this week? I wonder who that could be. Not going to say anything? John? <laughs> How old are you going to be, John? I quit having them. You quit having them, okay. So don't even, don't even celebrate it, huh? How old are you going to be? 71. 71. That's not old. Just a baby. Just a baby. <laughs> I can't say that. But. All right. Okay, any others? Okay, let's sing Happy Birthday to John. begin our worship together, our corporate worship, we're going to read uh, from Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. Uh, this is in the book of Revelation, talking about, the, 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 uh, talking about worship, and uh, the angel comes and he says that these words, so let's, let's read those words together, it says, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his, his Messiah, 
and he will reign forever and ever. Let's sing together. So much for this day. Thank you for this opportunity we have to gather in a place such as this to worship you. So Father, we ask you now to bless this service. Father, we ask you to um, that, that our worship would be acceptable to you this day and that you would be glorified. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Please have a seat. Let's continue um, worship here this morning with wonderful grace of Jesus. <laughs>
burger time here this morning. We're going to um, sing together, give thanks. Um, I didn't receive any cards here this morning, but we'll take some requests after um, we sing this song together and before we pray. Uh, if you're watching this online, you can uh, put it in the comment section and we'll mention that as well. So let's sing together, give thanks, and then we'll um, go into our corporate prayer time. treatment slides are going to start in this week, so remember them. Um, and also remember Bobby Alford as well. Um, he's in his treatments. And then he's having a biopsy on liver, right? Well, he already had a biopsy. Already had a biopsy. Let's, Let's see somebody. It is liver cancer, but yeah. we won't see anybody until December 4th. December 4th, so remember um, Bobby as well. Okay, any others? mission this week is eyes, so not only remember eyes, but I'll remember the places they're at, they're up in the North Carolina area, that part, from that one they're getting down in Florida as well, so remember all those, um, they've been um, displaced by these hurricanes and had lost um, homes and all those different things, so pray for their uh, continued healing, okay, any other? Okay, let's pray together. Let's pray Sunday, Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity you give us this day to, to worship together and to gather in a place such as this to worship you. And Father, we just pray um, that this day uh, that you would, uh, you would just be with us as we minister in our community, that you would continue to um, provide doors and open doors for us uh, and show us ways that we can minister to our community, that we can win others to Christ. And Father, we pray this afternoon for um, the Trunk of Tree event, um, our outreach event. I just pray that you would um, provide opportunities for us to make contact with families that are, are meeting a church and uh, meeting um, a relationship with you. And Father, just open those doors and help us to see those open doors um, as we use this event this afternoon. Father, just ask blessings upon it and, and safety and that um, it would be a, a huge success. Uh, Father, we also ask you to be with our missions and especially today for Ides. Uh, continue to bless her, especially as she steps into these emergency, emergency situations and Continue to be with those who are recovering in, um, from these two um, hurricanes, one um, up in the North Carolina area that was hit pretty hard, and again in Florida. And, uh, just to be with all those and as they recover. Father, we ask you to be with those who are fighting um, different ailments, and as you be with um, Bobby as he um, fights his cancer, and as well as Mike White and all the others um, that are recovering, and as you place your hands upon them who are fighting cancer, and that you just bring their body to healing. Be with those doctors and tend to their needs and just help them. Father, we're so thankful uh, for this day uh, that we can gather and worship you. And we just now ask for uh, your blessing on the remainder of our service. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For our uh, communion hymn this morning, we're going to read, uh, sing the Solid Rock uh, for our communion hymn. Um, again, the, the um, communion emblems are in the back of the auditorium on, the, on those trays. If you haven't picked yours up yet, as we sing this next song, you, um, our communion song, you can uh, go back and pick that up. After we sing, uh, we'll have a short devotion, we'll have a prayer, 
and I'll come back up and we will take communion together <coughs> and then we'll spend a few moments meditating that before we continue our service. So sing with me the solid rock as we prepare for communion. <laughs> Communion service usually is a very quiet gathering. The music is usually soft and people do not talk and laugh among themselves. This is almost universally true regardless of the church tradition of those partaking. While there is an appropriate sense of joy in the celebration of what Jesus has done for us, there is also a silent awe that comes over us because of the magnitude of the sacrifice. Our quietness is almost instinctive. So it was for a monk, as the old story goes, who was assigned to do that homily for the brothers in his mount, monastery. He had never preached before, and he announced he would be preaching on the love of Christ. The brothers wondered what he would say on that topic that would be original. When it came time for the message, the lights went out. Silently, the monk came to the front of the chapel and lit a candle. He held the candle up to the crucifix on the wall, let the light linger on the wounded feet of Jesus. He then moved the candle slightly so the congregation could see the wounded hands of Jesus. He paused for them to see the wounded side of Jesus. Finally, the candle highlighted the wounded brow of Jesus. And saying nothing, he blew out the candle and dismissed the crowd. Was it really a sermon? The brother saw so, and so did I. He had led the worshipers to meditate on the wounds of Christ. Something similar happens when we look at and eat the bread, which represents Christ's body, and when we look at it and drink the cup that represents his blood. Silently, we look at the bread and it speaks to us. Silently, we look at the cup and it speaks to us. We could talk long and wax eloquent about the sacrifices of Christ, but it needs no rhetorical flourishes from us. The suffering of Christ speaks to us in the quietness of the moment. That is a sermon worth listening to. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity you have to be in your house, to come about your table, partake of these emeralds which represent your body and your blood. We pray that everyone would do so in a worthy manner, Lord. Remember your death and resurrection until you come again. We pray all these things in Christ Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's take the elbows together now. Let's first take the bread, which represents Jesus' body. Let's take that together. Let's now take the cup, which represents Jesus' body. 
tells us how this meditate on this. We also got resource day is um, after worship and bring back our tithes and our offerings. So again, this morning the offering plates are in the back of the auditorium. So if you haven't already um, placed your offering in those um, yet, you can do that on the way out today. Also, those who are with us online or maybe don't have it with you today, you can also get through our app, also our website. As far as your own bank, you can write a check and mail it here, or you uh, um, you can use any of those methods. So let's pray today to get today for our offerings as our act of worship. Let's pray together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, as we think about um, the lives that we have, then we are blessed people. Um, our daily needs are met, uh, they're provided for. Um, Father, we have um, health care, and we have so many other things, so many amenities that many people around this world don't even have. And so, so sometimes in our affluent um, culture that we live in, forget about thanking you for the blessings of this life. We gather here this morning as our act of worship of, to remember those blessings and remember the way that you bless us. And as our outpouring of that, we bring back a portion of the way that you have blessed us. So Father, this morning, as our act of worship, we bring these things to you. We provide them to you so you can use them for the building up of your kingdom. So Father, this morning, we ask blessings upon that offering. We ask blessings of those who are who are giving those offerings and, and providing those offerings for our church. And uh, Father, we ask them that, that you would bless those, but Father, that they would be used for the building of your kingdom. So we pray these things this day in your son's most precious and holy name. Amen. At this time, kids are dismissed to the children's church. Today we are in the um, last sermon and the last thing we're going to be studying in this series that we've been talking about, making disciples, um, being disciple makers. And this series has been based on the parable that Jesus uh, told about the soils. 
Um, I used to have a used to go eat lunch with a guy named uh, Greg uh, quite often, and one of his absolute favorite places to go eat is at uh, IHOP. He really loved it. And I guess from the title of the sermon, you can't even guess what his favorite item to order was. So we get, the first time I ever eat with them, we get into the place, and I'm ordering my food, and then he orders his. And then he says, I will take the Rudy Tootie Fresh and Fruity. And I kind of looked at him, and I said this, and I probably, this was, this was so bad. I said, Greg, I never heard a man order that before. And he goes, what? I said, I've never heard a man order that before. And just kind of as a joke, he kind of got sullen. But to this day, he has never ordered the Rudy Tooty Fresh and Fruity with me ever again. <laughs> but to say that, to say we have influence, right? We have influence to the people in our lives. And sometimes we use the influence for good, and sometimes we use it for bad. But we've been talking about being fruitful, right? Being the fruitful soil. We describe the thorny soil in the, the parable as too busy. And we describe the good soil as the fruitful soil. Uh, we shared in week one that if we're going to be a follower of Jesus, and if we want to live lives that multiply into others, but, but for a large percentage of us, we, we, we say words like we're too busy to do that. Uh, that is a more accurate description of our lives, that we have just busy lives. We don't have time for those type of things. And it's easy to shrug our shoulders with a twinge of guilt and accept the reality that there's really nothing that we really can do about that. We said that the thorns are not the second, not uh, are not the second best option out of the four. It's the difference between life and death for you and for me, and for the generations that are yet to come. Right? The families are yet to come. So we've been in training for the past three weeks, developing some habits that a good disciple maker should have. You remember the first habit we talked about is that of prayer. If we're going to be a great disciple maker, we're going to win others to Christ, we need to be praying people. We learn some simple tools that we, we can't just skip if we're going to live in the good soil. We have to be praying. And then last week we looked at how do we engage with people that really don't know God. And how to have these intentional conversations that move towards disciple making. These disciple making relationships. And uh, we, we talked about last week of moving our conversation just for the, from the superficial type of conversation to some more meaningful conversation. And our challenge last week is to have some meaningful conversations. And uh, how meaningful, have, and once we have those meaningful conversations, then we can move them into some spiritual conversations. And, um, and then, that, then that's when we get the opportunity to start sharing Bible stories and how they relate. Today we're going to conclude with learning what to do once we found someone to disciple. We found that person. To live in that fruitful soil, we need to see more than just that, uh, more than just that one person. We want them to make disciples as well. We need to see, uh, we need to see the harvest that can come from a life of intentionality and from faithfulness. So let's look at our first scripture this morning. I want us to look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And this is what it says there. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. How many generations are mentioned in that one verse. See, uh, in that verse, the person, uh, there's a person there who is Paul, right? He had Paul. And he poured his life into the next person, which was Timothy. And Timothy, who then passed that on to a reliable person, that would be the next person, and who was able to pass that on to others, which would have been the last person, right? So, so uh, for years... That's exactly how I thought about that passage, that image in my mind of what was going on there. There one that started with Paul, went to Timothy, Timothy found another person, and they found another person. And it moved like that. But we're going to, we're, we're going to look at it a little bit differently here this morning. Uh, 
I think it, it, what, what Paul really was talking about, it's going to be something that looks like this. The passage says, we're going to have a person that we're going to call Paul. And it was Paul, right, who started this. And then the passage says, and the things you heard me say in the presence of many witnesses. Is the word witnesses single, singular or plural? It's plural, right? So, so then you have Paul, and then you have people that heard Paul. That's more than one person. And they were, and then those people, start with Paul, and then you have several. And then the, he, those people entrusted to reliable people. And, and so again, is that singular or plural? A plural again, right? So you have more people. That, that circle got bigger. And finally Paul tells the reliable people to pass on what you learn to others. Singular or plural? Plural again. So you have this huge group of people. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger because everyone is sharing. See, it started with one person, then it grows bigger and bigger and bigger. See, this was Paul's strategy of how to reach a lot of people for Christ. This is how Jesus did it as well. If, if, we, if we're called to obey everything Jesus commanded us, we need to learn not, uh, not, uh, not just just how to make disciples, but how to make people who make people make other disciples. We need to find, make people disciple makers. And today we're going to learn how we do that by looking through what, how Jesus discipled people. So let's look at our first passage. And our next passage is Luke chapter 5, and we'll be looking at starting in verse 1. Luke 5, starting in verse 1, and it says this, one day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw the water's edge. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, and the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon. Put out into the water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we worked all we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell down. He fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so, so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. We could... We could easily do a whole message, a whole message on this passage just by itself. But I want you to focus on just those two simple truths. Peter obeyed Jesus. He didn't have to pull the boat out a little from the shore. He didn't have to put his newly washed nets back into the water. But, and he surely didn't have to leave a year's worth of fish on the beach and then follow Jesus. But if he didn't obey, then he would have missed so much. Jesus made this invitation clear to Peter. He was inviting him to follow him, and Peter needed to obey Jesus. He didn't tell Peter exactly what, what, what it meant, but he clearly knew he, it would involve sacrifice. Last week we talked about um, having discovery conversations where we share a Bible story with someone we are looking at maybe potentially being a disciple. And at some point, we need to make the relationship official and invite that person to meet together regularly to learn more about God. So the first thing we need to learn as we begin to disciple someone is simply ask if they would be open to meet at least on a weekly basis. Share how you enjoyed formally meeting um, to discuss Bible stories together, but would they have an interest of putting something on the schedule? So our first takeaway, if you'll put this in your notes here this morning, our first takeaway is this. Make a formal invitation. In a daily relationship, we call that uh, defining the relationship, right? You normally don't wait to do that in the middle of your first spiritual conversation, but if you skip this, this step or wait too long, usually it usually fades over time. We also learn here 
that our disciple making must be, put this in your notes, focus on obedience. It's very easy to make a disciple making not, that it's just knowledge based, right? It's easy to make it just a knowledge based discipleship. And for sure, those things, there's things that a disciple really does need to know. He needs to learn. Jesus is not looking for the uneducated. He's looking for the obedient. So when you begin meeting with someone, it's important that for it, important that each of you walk away with some practical way you are going to obey the passage. In coming up with an application step, remember the, the vagueness is the enemy of obedience. Vagueness is the enemy of obedience. For example, if you study the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, it would be much better to pick someone you are going to serve that week than to simply say that I'm going to try to serve this week some more. The more specific the application step, the more likely that you will obey. That you will obey. It. So put this in your notes. Underneath those first two, put this. So as disciple makers, we, must, we, we need to make an invitation. And second, we need to focus on obedience. Let's look at our next passage. Found over in Luke. Luke chapter 9, starting at verse 28. Let's read that together. Luke chapter 9, starting at verse 28. He says, About eight days after Jesus said this, he, he took Peter, John, and James with him, and he went up into a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and the clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw the glory and the two men standing with them. As the men were leaving Jesus, when they were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. And while he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at this time what they had seen. Once again, we could, we, could, we, uh, we could do a couple sermons on this passage as well, right? All by itself. But I want us to simply notice that Jesus brought Peter, James, and John with him. He wanted these three disciples to witness his deity through the transfiguration. He often br uh, brought others along in the most personal of moments. The large majority of the Gospels is made up of Jesus spending time with his disciples. As he interacted with those he met along the way, he also was um, always living out a secondary mission of training up his disciples who were watching his every move. You know, we can spell disciple as F-R-I-E-N-D. What does that spell? Friend. Friend, right? The third thing I want you to put in your notes here is that we can learn about disciple making is that it is an invitation to friendship. See, we studied in John chapter 15 a few weeks ago. Listen to what Jesus said about those he discipled. I'll put it on the screen for you. Greater love has no man than this, to lay one's life for one's friends. You, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. Paul at one point said to the church at Thessalonica, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting verse 7, Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we care for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our very lives as well. Our invitation to disciple someone it is more than just a one-hour meeting at Starbucks each week. We are inviting them to be a part of our life. And this practically means this. Your, your families meet each other. 
You have been in each other's homes. You know each other's story, the good and the bad. They, they know they can call you for help. You dis, your disciples should experience the love of Jesus in your relationships before they, they even fully grasp what God has done for them on the cross. If we are looking to make disciples, that make disciples, that is especially important. Down the road, then, they start pouring into others. They will follow your example in how they pour into others. See, notice, I haven't given you any specific curriculum, right? That when you start discipling someone, start doing it. Here's page one, do this in page, week one, do this in week two, do this in week three. I'm just giving you some foundational truths that you need to apply no matter what material that you use. So look in your notes. Break this in as well. As disciple makers, we need to make and ask, then focus on obedience and realize that an invitation to a friendship. Let's look at another passage of Scripture found in Matthew um, chapter 16, starting in verse 13. Matthew 16, verse 13. And this is what it says. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven. And then verse 18, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Notice that Jesus didn't tell, just tell Peter who he was. He asked him. Jesus was the master question asker. See, think about it. He's the all-knowing God in a body yet he spent most of his time wanting to hear what others had to say. He knew that a message discovered is more powerful than a message delivered. <clears throat> have you found that to be true in your life as well? The truths that we discover on our own shape our lives on a way deeper level than when we just have someone tell us. A fourth element to put in your notes is that a disciple maker, we, as a disciple maker, we need to lead people to discovery. If you can help them discover how to hear God through His Word and the Holy Spirit, then their ability to grow has no limits. This means that we need to let God be the teacher. Every time we meet, let God's Word be the focus. There are lots of great resources, um, but to make sure that you have one that leads people to Christ, to, you need to find one that's really going to lead people to uh, directly from God's Word, and lead people to Christ. A great resource is one that's used by millions and millions of churches uh, around the world. It's called the Disco Discovery Bible Study. I made copies of that course this morning, and it's back there on the table between the two offering plates. If you want to take a look at that and, and look at that, maybe that's something you can use. But the beauty of this resource, like this, is that anyone can use this resource. Uh, you can disciple anyone using this resource. You don't need all the answers. You just need to study a passage of Scripture together and then ask the questions on the sheet. If you focus on discovery, your disciples will be able to pass on what they are learning from you to others, right? Very early on. You also need to help our disciple discover, our disciple discover how to hear directly from the Holy Spirit. To give space to be quiet and let God speak to them in a still, small voice. See, God's Spirit will never contradict God's Word. But He will speak directly into the stresses and the struggles that they're dealing with. And when they, uh, when they do ask Him. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus tells Peter that the truth that Jesus was the Messiah was revealed to him by his Father who is in heaven. God still works that same way today. So fill in your blanks. So with our disciples, we need to make and ask, 
focus on obedience, invite them into a friendship, then lead people to discover. I want us to look at one last passage here this morning. Found over in John chapter 21. Starting at verse 15. Look what it says. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Jesus was, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. You know the context of this scene, right? Most of us do. A few painful days after Peter had denied even knowing Jesus in the greatest time of his need, he had then watched him be crucified and had been fishing with a, which is hugely significant, right? He's back to his old profession that he had before Jesus called him to follow him. He no longer felt worthy to be called his disciple and he was returning to life he knew before he had met Jesus. Then Jesus shows up on the beach and Peter um, dives into the water um, and, and swims to the shore. Now, Jesus and Peter are enjoying a breakfast just between the two of them and his questions could have not been more personal. Three straight times Jesus asked Peter, if he really loved making up for Peter's three denials the week before. It ends with Peter's reinstatement. Then follow me. If Jesus was going to forgive him, why did he bring up Peter's worst moment in the first place? See, he was acknowledging the sin, but giving grace at the same time. For us as disciple makers, not only does it need to be obedience based, but it also needs room for accountability. Put that in your notes, room for accountability. See, this is something that is absolutely necessary if anyone is going to grow spiritually, but unfortunately also something we are usually pretty bad at. Think about it. In every area of your life, accountability is huge. If you want to start working out or stop smoking or memorizing scripture, it is incredibly helpful to have someone help keep you accountable. And I think sometimes accountability gets a bad name because of the two extremes. There's first is what we call guilt-based accountability. And this is when the other person tries to make you feel guilty, um, really guilty, if you don't follow through. And often this results in people walking away and a lot of times a loss of a friendship. Don't do that. Not, don't use guilt-based accountability. And then there's the opposite end of the spectrum and it's what we call overly graceful accountability. By the name, this sounds like a good thing, right? When we make it no big deal when someone doesn't follow through. We make accountability useless and nobody grows in their faith because Oh, we're just human. And just go on, right? Instead, we need the kind of accountability that's going to lead us into transformation. And the name I want to give, and it's often called this, is called problem-solving accountability. When someone falls short, because that is the reality, we ask questions like, is there still something you sense God is calling you to obey? What lessons have you learned so far? How will this next week be different than this week? Then don't give them another obedience step till they get a win with this first one. Around the world where the gospel is exploding, I mean exploding, they have a simple saying, 
Learn one thing, do one thing. And if we do this well, there will be some awkward moments, but we will raise up disciples that will obey and grow. See, this all means that we need to make disciples in community. It's why Jesus sent out the disciples two by two. And why Jesus, why, and why also Paul followed that same example in the book of Acts. So let's bring the series all together as we close this up. Close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to envision a very possible scene in the future. You go from this series and start praying for God to use you as a disciple maker. And he starts opening your eyes to opportunities all over the place. You and your neighbor are both out getting your mail at the same time. And you decide for the first time to intentionally go beyond casual conversation about the weather and learn some things that you never knew about them. You end up talking for 30 minutes and learn that they have a lot of stressful things going on in their family. You casually ask if anyone has ever prayed for their struggles in their family. And before you know it, you're praying for them on the sidewalk. You're pretty sure their eyes were wet as they walked away. A few days later, you meet them at the mailbox again and ask if you could share a story. And uh, you could share a story with them. And they thought that, that you thought that might encourage them. So they gladly accept you share a story about Jesus calming the storm and bringing a, peace, bringing a terrible situation into a, a peaceful one. You spend a few moments discussing it together and how you could each apply it to your lives. It, go, it goes like this, right? That you finally tell that story at that mailbox and it becomes a thing, right? It becomes a, a thing between you. And after a month of doing this, you ask if they'd be open to grabbing coffee each week to continue learning about God together. And you're shocked that they said yes. And a little while later, they, they make a remark about a story that it, it sure seems like Jesus was forgiving people of their sin all the time. And naturally, that moves into a conversation about how they can have their sins forgiven and how you can lead them into a relationship with Jesus. And a week later, you're studying a passage about that baptism together and they share their obedience step that they were, they're ready to be baptized and as long as you will be the one who baptizes them. And a week later, and you're, you're standing in the water here at this church and maybe in somebody's backyard and both of your families are celebrating new life together and then you get out of the way and watch them baptize the rest of their family. Because each week after you stay together, they were sharing what they learned with their family and their friends and their spouses and their kids. And pretty amazing story, right? One disciple makes another. Some part of the story is not just possible. It is really actually God's plan for our lives. And I'm sharing this story. Uh, what, face, what face did you picture when I began to tell a story about being in the water with you? Maybe a neighbor, maybe someone from work, maybe a sibling, maybe a, a longtime friend. That face didn't get there by itself. God was speaking to you right now. And now you know what you need to do. What are you going to do about it? My hope is that we would be that this wouldn't just be just another series that we went through this year, but that we did as a church, but it would be a life-changing kickstart to being a church of fourth soil followers of Jesus. We've introduced a lot, of, a lot in the past few weeks. We, we introduced prayer calendars and conversation, conversation quadrants and the right um, environment to disciple someone and ultimately disciple others. And I want to end today with giving you just a few minutes. And I want us to have a few minutes of silent prayer. And then I'm going to close with a prayer. And just ask God, what is my next step? What do you want me to do? Let's pray. so much for the time we've had together you know, to study these, these, about these soils and, and what you would have us and what you would call us to do. So Father, I just pray, whatever commitment we made this day, that we would keep that commitment. Father, help us to have our eyes open and look at, to see around us you know, the people that you have put in our paths who need to know you. And help us 
let help us to lead them to in a relationship with you. Father, we just pray that you would make us not only disciple makers, but people who make disciples who make disciples. Father, this morning as we get ready to conclude and as we close up here today, maybe there's some decision um, that needs to be made public this day. Maybe someone who's, who's outside of Christ, whatever it is this day, Father, we just pray as we give this opportunity that they would um, make a decision for you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> We're going to sing a song of invitation here this morning. Maybe there's some here that needs a relationship with Christ. You haven't accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you need to be immersed into Him. We'll give you that opportunity here this morning. Maybe there's others here. There's just some other decision that needs to be made public. Maybe it's a prayer. Maybe it's something else. But whatever it is, will you come as we stand, stand and sing? Stand with me.
forget um, trunk or treat this afternoon. If you had signed up for food and you haven't brought it up here yet, make sure you bring that as well and then come and, and join us this afternoon at 5 o'clock. Let's close with prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the challenges to our lives. And Father, um, just help us to live up to those, um, those expectations. And so Father, as we now leave here, we ask your blessings upon the rest of our day. Um, ask your blessings upon our event this afternoon. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.